On today's episode, we're looking at semi-solid casting and trends in the global automotive die casting market. That's this week in engineering. Today's episode is brought to you by engineering.com, the world's trusted source for engineering content. Check out this and many other videos for the working engineer on engineering.com slash TV today. You know, die casting, well, it's been around a long time for zinc and aluminum bearing alloy small part production. Now it's always been a go-to technology when dimensional accuracy with big volumes were needed. Die casting can accurately produce complex components and high performance alloys with fine grain structures, but it has some limitations. Flash at the mold parting lines, knit lines, sink marks, ejector pin marks, shrink and distortion, and notably porosity are all dependent on die design, machine parameters, and good feedback control. Now gases entrained in the alloy due to the turbulent flow entering the mold, well that can be a serious problem when porosity is an issue. Semi-solid casting, however, can really reduce porosity by allowing a more laminar flow of metal into the mold. And in some cases, it can produce densities and grain structures that may let die castings replace even forging as a production process. In both semi-solid casting and die casting, metal is forced into a mold called a die, confusingly, at high temperatures and pressures. The key difference between die casting and semi-solid casting is that in die casting, the metal is in a fully liquid state, while in semi-solid casting, the metal is between its solidus and liquid temperatures. You phase transition people understand that. This means that there's a mixture of solid phase globules surrounded by liquid metal. Now you can see this in a phase diagram. Now in this state, the semi-solid metal exhibits something called thixotropy. Now this is a property where a fluid is relatively viscous when static, but it becomes less viscous when subjected to shear stress. The faster you shear the melt, the less force you need to apply, the more liquid the melt becomes. There are three distinct semi-solid casting processes. One, fixo casting, well it's an older process typically used for aluminum alloys. It requires a specially precast billet with a non-dendritic microstructure, adding significant cost to the process. This billet is then induction heated to form a semi-solid within a conventional die casting machine before being injected into a die. Now this process makes it very difficult to reuse materials and must first be recast into that billet with the correct microstructure. Second, Rio casting is a newer process used for aluminum alloys. It uses the same casting machinery, furnace, and handling automation as conventional die casting, but the difference is the addition of a slurry maker, which is really a spindle that stirs the material in a crucible as it's being transferred from the furnace to the casting machine. The solid fraction is high, which is important for good results. And the third, thick molding, well, that's used for magnesium alloys primarily. It's very similar to injection molding of plastics with magnesium alloy chips fed into a barrel where they're heated and metered using a screw conveyor. The action of the screw generates shear forces required for thixotropic thinning. There are many process and performance advantages to semi-solid casting compared to conventional die casting. Lower temperatures, lower pressures, and laminar flow into the die, well, that means less entrained gas and lower porosity. For many applications, this is very important. Voids are potential stress risers and crack initiation sites, and a fully dense structure can allow the use of lower cost materials, reduce or eliminate post-processing, or both. Another advantage is better fatigue life along with that brittle fracture improvement, and it's possible to use alloys that are weldable. The lower temperature combined with a high proportion of solidity means that there's less shrinkage. Now, this enables tighter tolerances to be maintained. Wall thicknesses can vary between less than a millimeter and over 20 millimeters. Now, precision die casting was pioneered at GM in the 1950s, and it's been a cost-effective part-making process in the automotive and consumer goods industries ever since. Die casting for mass production uses relatively low melting point alloys of aluminum and zinc, and that lower temperature means tool wear is lower, and one setup can operate for hundreds of thousands of cycles. The automotive die casting market is expected to register a compound annual growth rate of more than 6.2% in the next five years. Now, this is strong growth for a mature technology, especially with complex supply chain issues and the trend towards reshoring. The auto industry, well, it's again the driver, with both internal combustion engine and electric vehicle technologies carrying multiple components that can be cost-effectively die-cast in the chassis and the driveline. Now, Tesla is attempting a gigantic die-cast subframe assembly as part of a new stressed battery pack structure for their new Model Y. Now, this is to be built in the company's Berlin plant. This is the biggest ever attempted in this application, and if it works, it could make die casting more important than hydroforming or stamping in chassis design. Now that's a big if, but this one will be a showcase for precision lightweight part design and production in die casting. Now traditionally, die casting is it's not being considered a lightweighting technology, but advanced simulation software and more sophisticated tooling design well, lets modern part designers use thinner sections with more complex and skeletonized reinforcement to give good flatness and surface finish. And in many cases, the parts can be used as casts, significantly lowering production costs. Die casting is a major production technology everywhere where consumer goods are mass produced. 
Looking at the market on a global basis, the Asia-Pacific region dominates the automotive die-casting market, accounting for over 55% market share in 2019. It's also expected to witness the fastest growth rate during the forecast period. China is in the lead, followed by Japan and India. In 2018, China registered more than 26,000 metal casting plants. The Chinese economy is growing as disposable income of middle-class consumers and vehicle demand increases, both driving factors for all casting technologies. Passenger car sales in 2019 dropped to 21.44 million units in China, now it's down 9.6% compared to the previous year. Now, this relatively small decline has continued with the coronavirus and consequent economic slowdown. However, passenger car sales are expected to increase over the forecast period. It's the world's biggest market. The global market is highly fragmented with many regional small to medium-sized players from the developing countries entering the die-casting industry. With large OEMs and Tier 1s looking to advance die-casting to lower unit costs and longer production runs, major players such as NEMAC, George Fisher Automotive and others, well, they focused revenues on R&D, mainly to develop better production processes and alloys. Many engineers and manufacturing experts regard die-casting as an older, legacy technology, but it's far from that, and it's well worth a look for anyone needing strong, light alloy parts in volume at low cost. And that's today's edition of This Week in Engineering. Thanks for watching.